Hi everybody, this is Karen Barbie, baby boomer belly dancer, back for another episode. And today I have with me absolutely no one else at belly dance. This is going to be the most exciting podcast ever. Who's in the room with me, you ask? <laughs> so first and foremost, sorry, Julie. First and foremost, we have the founder and conductor of the National Arab Orchestra, Michael Ibrahim, here with us from Detroit. Welcome, hey, hey. Michael. Good to be here. And then I have Julie Scott Milkey, who is the former executive director of the Youth Orchestra of San Antonio, but she's my cousin, really, she's my cousin. And we're going to talk today about how we got Michael and the National Arab Orchestra into Texas. Seems like a simple topic, but it's an incredible story about divine order as far as I'm concerned. So I need to I need to frame it. I always need to frame it by explaining a little bit about Project Band. So at Caravan Studio, Project Band is the curriculum that I use to train dancers to dance. Okay, these words are always important to me. Musically relevant performance level improvisation. Okay, all of those words matter in my world. And so this came about because I'd been dancing for you know, decades and decades and decades and decades, and I was bored with everything else. And as I pondered on what my biggest growth spurt was as a dancer, it was hands down when I got to work with live music on an ongoing basis. And I wanted to simulate that for my students. And so the easiest way for me to simulate that was to reach out to my friends, uh, the musicians in Houston that I've worked with so much over the years. And that's the Gafour Brothers. And they, uh, they play keyboards and percussion. And so for a few years, Project Band was running with those guys and going great guns. And, and then I was trying to think of ways to expand it. And uh, the immediate thing that came to mind was to add instruments. Because to me, adding instruments is like demanding additional fonts of movement off of a dancer. And so that was, that was going to be my way to, to grow their vocabulary. So the first person I reached out to was my friend Nasser in Los Angeles, who plays food. A couple of years later, after running Project Band with the Houston guys in Nasser, I reached out to George Lamont, who I've known for decades and decades, uh, who plays violin from San Francisco. And then, then we ran that for a while. And then I started thinking, now what? Now what kind of sound do I want to add to this? And I decided that the sound I wanted was, okay, so what should I call it today? Nay, nai, nay. Potato, potato. Okay, so I'm going to go with nay. <laughs> I decided I wanted to find someone that could play the nay. And for those of you who don't know, that's the Arab sound. So starting in early 2015, I went to YouTube, and I would invite any of you to do this right now. Go to YouTube and type in the words nay takasim, T-A-K-S-I-M, and see what you find. It's going to look like that. <laughs> that's what you're going to see. And so for about... 18 months, I just sat there watching solo after solo after solo after solo of this guy playing the Ney. And then I started paying attention to, wait a minute, he's in front of a whole bunch of other musicians. Who the hell are these people? What's going on here? You know, I'm, I'm looking at the notes in all of the YouTube videos, finding anything I can search on. I'm searching on you, finding articles in Arab American periodicals up in Detroit, Al Jazeera had mm. stories about you and the orchestra, just anything I could find in stock in your Facebook page, like just all of this kind of stuff. My students think I've lost my mind. I'm obsessing over it. In every class, there would be some part of the class that had some music out of YouTube by the National Arab Orchestra, just going crazy with this. And yet, and this is what's interesting. I just had this revelation a couple of days ago. And yet I thought, even if I could find that guy, I don't know how I would go to somebody who's, you know, like in this tuxedo at the front of an orchestra playing music at this level and say, can you come join us in Texas and play for my belly dancers? Like that felt really uncomfortable to me, even though I submit to all of our dancer community talk about, damn it, we're artists too. We work hard, blah, blah, blah. We deserve respect. All of that. I really do believe that. And yet that part of me was nervous about approaching someone with an orchestra to come and join us. So, so I just had this all spinning out in my head, and it was in, oh gosh, I think the summer of 2016, when I was chatting with uh, my friend Nasser, the one that I had invited to join us on Eid, and I said, hey, 
I'm just kind of thinking to add another instrument to all of this, and I'm thinking about the name. Do you know anybody? And he's like, ah, I think there's somebody in Northern California, but I don't know if there's any good. And he said, well, then, then, then you know there's that guy in Detroit, Michael Ibrahim. And I was like, <gasps> you know him? And so then that led to him telling me that you guys were going to be playing at uh, an event for Cassandra, sure, one of my heroes in the dance world, in Minneapolis. Of course, I drop everything, grab some of my dancers. We book our flights to Minneapolis so we can go and meet Michael. So let's just, let's just, now I'll start fast forwarding it. So we get to Minneapolis, we meet you. I invite you to come to San Antonio the next year to join us in our show. And you said, okay. In between the time I met you and our show that next year, that was, that next year was our GBDAC 2017. In between that, I was able to get to Detroit to see a Tuft Ensemble concert there that you had invited me to. And I can remember talking to you after the concert was over and you said, what do you think? Or something like this go over in San Antonio. And I'm like, sure. But I had no idea. I had no idea how. And that was in March of 2017. And so I, I came home from that and thought about it for a while. I remember waking up in the middle of the night thinking, how am I going to put this together? I'm playing on Facebook and I see some stuff come up for Dream Week, which is our big, it's really not a week, it's almost two weeks now, I think, of um, events centered around diversity and, and other cultures centered around the Martin Luther King Day celebration. And so once that piece came into my head, I thought, okay, I need to move. I need to move on this somehow. And that's when I went to you, Julie. That's when I went to you. And I said, okay, this is about music. I know Jack about the music scene in San Antonio, but you, having been the executive director of the youth orchestra of San Antonio, I thought, okay, help me fill in some blanks here. So do you want to take it away from that that day that I invaded your home. And we, <laughs> and we sat around my kitchen table. Yes. Yeah. And we sat around the kitchen table and you were like, okay, who do you know in San Antonio in the music community that might, you know, be able to, someone that would be able to introduce Michael around and, you know, that type of thing. So, and we went down the list of names and we shortlisted it and we went after a few and uh, then we, um, I was supposed to be in an advisory capacity, <laughs> yeah. which is not exactly how it turned out, but that's okay. I mean, it's been about, because I've been retired, so, but not not the new project. Um, but we, you, you basically came to me because I knew the orchestral world, right. and that's where we kind of crisscrossed and came up with ideas, and I think that's when we started calling people that summer, and... Uh, I don't want to go into the next part of it. Well, that's okay. That's okay. But I, I did, I, that was probably, I know you came to our show in um, yes. the, the Billy Ann's showcase where Michael was there for the first time yes. deliberately to see Michael. I had invited Shokare, not Podia, with Dream Week also. Mm -hmm. I don't think either one of y'all ever been to any of my shows, but y'all came because I'm like, you got to come and see Michael. Right. You've got to meet Michael because we need to work as a team forward about bringing that that ensemble that piece of the orchestra to san antonio so um yeah it actually was patting my audience getting you guys there to yeah. watch the show and get on board with that and and um and then it was shortly after all that and maybe this is where you were fixing to head when you got the invitation since you're the former executive director of yosa the youth orchestra you got the invitation to their annual fundraising luncheon and that was in september right. and that, that's when i thought oh that would be the perfect time for everybody to get together because Everybody will be in one room at one time, and we can introduce people and see where it goes from there. Right. And right. Uh, I think that I, I may have even talked to Trey Peters, who's the current music director at Yosa, at that time, to let him know what we were up to, mm -hmm. and uh, invite him to like an after luncheon coffee. Exactly. That we could brainstorm. It. Exactly. Yes. And I remember. Um, do you remember all that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the luncheon, I, I remember when we brought you to the luncheon, one of the key players that we had there that um, was sitting at our table with us was Debbie Mary Fernandez, a um, key figure at the St. George Maronite Church in their community. And she's involved in their choir and with all of their cultural arts programs. And I just thought we have to have her on board. So um, I know that, that she was there with us. And, um, and that was when Michael was able to meet Troy. Because our thought was already that not knowing any more than we knew about how we were going to, to thread this needle and get this moving, that a collaboration 
made the most sense. Right. So to get you guys hooked up with the youth orchestra was, was what was going to make the most sense. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So then we had that meeting. That was in September. And this is what's hilarious because that was September. And then we scheduled a concert for January 6th. Yeah. Oh, my God. It, it was one of those miracle concerts. A miracle event because it just came together. It did. And we were planning it over the holidays. Mm -hmm. Insane. Insane. But we pulled together um, not just Debbie, but several other people from the Lebanese community. Of course, Saber, L.I.D. got involved. My buddy. And, yeah, and we had this fantastic concert on January 6, 2018. It's the first time San Antonio has seen such a thing. I think what people don't realize is how much front time you need to plan a concert. Most of the time, it'll be a year out before you plan it. So, for us, by the time Tori came on board, and it's that, it also involved a collaboration with some students from Youth Orchestra Center and Top Ensemble, too. And it was having to get everybody together. We started that process, really, truly started it October. Mm -hmm. So, we had... Three well, we months, had one months. month before we got slammed by the holidays, yeah. and then we had to keep threading things around the holidays, yeah, and, and still, a sold-out crowd. <laughs> it's okay, and I had faith in us, because I had already done one other type of event in four months, so I figured, no problem. We can right, <laughs> right, and we did. We did do it. It was, it was, it was a, a, an amazing success. Do you remember it, Michael? Yes. What do you remember about it? Everything. <laughs> We're gonna need a detail because I have to take your a drink. first impressions. <laughs> no, it was it was uh, it was pretty impressive how the community was able to put something like that on. It was the first time uh, that they had a cultural event like that. I know that the community in San Antonio isn't as developed as other Arab American communities uh, in the country, uh, and even with all of that, uh, it was able to pull it together and put on a sold out event. Yeah, it was, it was, well, it was so mind-blowing successful to those of us who had worked in such a short time frame that when we met for the debriefing, everybody was just like, bring the whole orchestra, like, let's go. I mean, everybody was just yeah. crazy on board. The big thing was we had a sold-out concert. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sold out. We only planned it in three months in advance, and uh, it, was kind of, it was kind of a, a Christmas present in a way because... I think I remember the, the lights at uh, in Carnival Word, they were twinkling before we went into the, into the concert. And it was like, huh. and everybody was so jovial out front mm -hmm. afterwards mm -hmm. and so excited about the event. Yeah. And we're like, okay, they want more. Yeah, exactly. And it was funny because there were people there that I saw in the lobby that I had seen 20 years before, you know, when I was really actively dancing out in the community that I hadn't seen in 20 years. And... They're still here, and they were like, get that in. <laughs> you know, it was just so amazing to see these people again in my community because since I stepped out of dancing at all these gigs and everything, I, I haven't seen them, but they're still there, and they were so excited to be a part of something like that because I think that you could sense that it was the start of something, you know, like anything that is that resoundingly successful is not going to be a one-time thing. You, you could just you could just tell this is this is going to this is going to get something going, and this isn't even a part of my notes. But let's just talk about that something going. Uh, there have been so many more events with live Arab music by singers musicians coming out of the woodwork in San Antonio that we didn't even know we had here because of that event. That event stirred up so much in people and, and gave them the interest, the, the courage, the whatever, the, the sense that there is a group that actually wants to be there if you were going to go out and play music. And, and that has kept going, even through the pandemic, that has kept going. So yeah, the power of that concert was huge in bringing out the community. But then, then we got together and we planned for the entire orchestra to come back. To San Antonio that same year. Oh my yeah. God! <laughs> like coming out of COVID, that just seems crazy that we were like planning two things yeah. in that one year. But the energy was so high when, when we had that uh, after after the fact review with everybody around the table mm -hmm. at uh, the restaurant. It was like we got to do this again. We got to do it bigger. We got to do it bigger. And all of a sudden, everybody's looking at their calendars. Like, okay, how soon do we do this? Again? Right. 
Right, we did. And and so later that year, it was in November, that we had the full orchestra come back into San Antonio, and that was at Trinity University. And I, I should back up just a, a tad and, and talk about when we had our first concert in January. And it was at the last minute. I can remember I was driving down Hildebrand Street <laughs> away from my studio, and I thought, I need to call Sadala in Houston and, and tell him that this is going on and see if he wants to come. It was a last-minute thought. I knew him from dancing in the clubs in Houston. But it, it just occurred to me to call somebody from Houston and ask them if they wanted to come see the Takht Ensemble at their first concert in San Antonio. He was all over it. He loves music. He's like, you know, not only will I be there, but he was a part of the, um, what is it, Lebanese group. What's the, I have so many acronyms in my head right now. The Lebanese group, and say, ALCC? Yeah. Like, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he was uh, on the board there, and he said, we're going to we're gonna buy an ad in your program, full-page ad to talk about their upcoming Lebanese festival, like full-on support. And he came for the concert. He stayed for the VIP reception the next day. Just so excited about it. We talked about it so much afterwards. And, and it was because of that, because of that last minute thought to call him and say, please come to this inaugural concert in San Antonio, that when we did bring back the full orchestra later that year, he and about 20 other people from Houston came. And they were all in the audience at Trinity University. Because I knew from the get-go that if the NAO is going to take hold in Texas, from everything that I'd experienced in my days with dancing and music and all that over the decades, and I, you know, primarily in San Antonio, but I've spent a ton of time in Houston, some time in Austin, some time in Dallas, but I always felt like Houston is where it's at. Houston is, is where we need to focus if we're going to have any kind of sustaining thing with the NAO in Texas. And so I was thrilled that between your contact up there in, in Detroit, Manal, mm-hmm. she was able to call some of her friends in Houston. I was reaching out to my friends in Houston, and we got that massive delegation to come into San Antonio for that full orchestra concert in November, because that is what launched the formation of this massive committee in Houston to then bring the orchestra back the next year with Abir Nehmi from Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, just off the charts concert, you know, and it still just blows my mind to think about, <laughs> you know, that, 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 the, the tiny little, well, I mean, let's just take it back to the damn Nay Taksim on YouTube, you know, and then just a few years later, this massive, massive concert in Houston and the support from what, 15 different Arab American organizations in Houston, all of them coming together in support of having the National Arab Orchestra play to a sold out crowd at Rice University. I mean, that's a 900 plus seat auditorium, just an amazing concert and Michael I am gonna I'm gonna pitch on the spot again and tell ask you to tell us your impressions of that concert in Houston talk to talk to us about how that felt uh, I mean it was it was good I think aside from like the actual stuff with concerts and everything I mean that every musician has those every musician has their feelings around the, their performances but the fact that I I got to see the objective of the orchestra really come into play was the biggest reward. You know, too often do we have uh, Arab institutions that start from where they are and work with what they have, rather than try to change or transform the situation for the better. And in the community, we have... uh, we have this way of doing things where uh, it works against us in some in some ways. Um, there's too much. No, I don't want to speak in that terms. But there, there's there's a, there's definitely a sense of individualism that hinders the ability to bring the community closer together to consolidate the voice, to consolidate the narrative. And uh, to see the that a concert was the catalyst for bringing that community together so that they forget the differences and rather look at what is the same, mm-hmm. that was that was the big takeaway for me for that. Because, you know, it's one thing, I could have easily taken my career and focused on myself and wrote some music and 
just played and be and be a performer. But I wanted to build an institution. A because um, there is no dedicated institution for simply the arts. The arts are always included in some political activism or social activism or some kind of context that really doesn't make it the focus. But when it comes, uh, but, you know, the NAO solely focuses on the art, devoid of any political discussion, any religious discussion, any social commentary. We don't, it's just not our business. Our business is culture. And when you deal in culture, then you start to have a different conversation. And that, for me, is where I really would want to uh, focus my energy on when it comes to work within the community. Because it's one thing for somebody, you know, to see somebody with an instrument, oh, he's a musician. But you have to have purpose behind your work as an artist. So we already do what we do well. Uh, so what contributions can what we do make to the greater discussion? Um, and for me, it's changing the narrative. You know, right now you go on the news, you find somebody talking as uh, you find an Arab on the news on Fox News, and now now they're playing defense. They're talking about this isn't who we are, and we are not like this, and this is these are narratives that are you know propagated, and then they go into this emotional diatribe, and then but at the end of the day, it just looks like another angry Arab on TV crying about misfortune. I, I, I'd, I would rather not play the game someone else set up for me. I would much rather own the narrative and say what I am rather than say what I'm not. You know? Because nobody can tell me what I am. They can argue uh, something that of what I say... Uh, you know, if I say, "Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm not a liar." Well, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instances that I can point to that say you are. But is it true or not? No, and especially in today, because we facts are kind of drawn out, and the idea of truth is not something that is crystal clear in today's society. So everybody has their own truth, but nobody can tell me what I'm not. You know, and the, the 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 bottom line is that the narrative we push forward for us as Arab Americans is that when it comes to the Arab world, it is a diverse mass of land that has so many different subcultures within it, all of it connected by certain unifying traits that make up the twenty two some countries of the Arab world. So uh, that was. Um, so to finally actually see that work, yeah, yeah, was a big deal for me. And it it was so beautiful. And I know that um, one of our key players in Houston made the statement because you have a building bridges through music program mm -hmm. associated with it, NAO. And so this idea of building bridges is a big deal. And I think that when a lot of people first look at that, they they think of building bridges across the culture of um, the Arab experience and the Western experience, the American experience or whatever. And, and this man in Houston made the statement, we can't build bridges to others until we first build them amongst ourselves. And, and that was just so beautifully stated because here are all of these organizations, the Egyptian organization, the Algerian, the Moroccan, the Lebanese, the Syrian, the, all of these organizations cooperating as one other gentleman on that committee pointed out, for the first time that he'd seen since he'd lived in Houston, which had been over 40 years, for the first time he'd seen all of these organizations coming together and, and for the purpose of putting on this National Arab Orchestra concert. And it was, it, it, by every measure, a success. And their debriefing meeting afterwards was just one big pep rally like like ours was you know just now what now what can we do and full force ahead they were ready to roll of course then the pandemic came but but you know i mean we were just in a meeting this morning it's all still there it's all still there and 
the, the pandemic afforded the National Arab Orchestra the opportunity to build their virtual community tremendously, tremendously, therefore keeping their relevance, keeping the interest there. And so now it's just a matter of going back to the people in Houston that have had their eyes on you the whole time. You know, nobody's taken their eye off of the NAO and and, and moving forward. And, and I think it's really exciting that as we talk about the upcoming things for the orchestra, we can target that the Takht Ensemble will be coming back to San Antonio later this year, October 2nd. And we're talking about that next concert in Houston later this year. And so, okay, so we skipped a year. Who didn't? <laughs> but but we're, it's alive. The NAO is alive and in many ways stronger than it was before. And now poised to move forward and sort of pick up where we left off. So, you know, those those many organizations that were there to support that first concert are going to be right there to support the next and the next and the next. And it's just going to, it's going to be everything that, that I somehow knew it was going to be when I made that random phone call <laughs> to my one friend in Houston and invited him to come and see you. So exciting times, super exciting times. I do, I forgot to talk about um, myself a little bit here <laughs> back because in January of 2018, when we brought that first concert to San Antonio. That's when I joined the board of the orchestra. Now, this is like, I remember posting on Facebook, said something like, on a scale of one to 10, how excited do you think I am about this? This is going to tell me how well you know me. And everybody's like, oh my God, 10, 10. Karen, this has to be so exciting for you because, you know, the, the idea of, of live music is what has really saved me and my dance studio. You know, if I couldn't have that, I'd be done. Straight up. I mean, anytime I think about having to work to record music, I just kind of cower because live music is, is just such a driving force. And, and, and I am proudly building snobs uh, out of my dancers because they're becoming the same way. Like once you have experienced live music and the higher the quality, the, the more you expect. And that's, that's part of what I want to create with all of this. So everyone knew that I was super excited to be, and, and you, you confirmed, kind of, sort of, the first non-Michigan human on the board of the National Arab Orchestra. Yeah, yeah, that was actually before the concert. Yeah, it was, right before the concert. And, and now we have three Texans, okay, myself, two in Houston mm -hmm. on the board, and another board member in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the board is just blowing wide open, and, and you can see where the opportunities for the NAO across the country, well, and beyond are just going to be incredible into the future. So, all right, moving on then. We, we finished up our, our Houston uh, concert. And before the, just before the pandemic hit, Julie, we all regrouped yeah. here in San Antonio. And we had another Takht Ensemble concert right. in January of 2020. That's right. And Debbie Mary Fernandez put together some students that were from St. George and around to learn uh, some of the music, I think Michael gave them the, the pieces, I don't know if they were your arrangements, I think, mm -hmm. and that they performed with the talk Dance. Song. That's true, because we had a, a huge group of, mm -hmm. of um, students participating in Houston yeah. with that concert. Yeah, yeah. so the, the idea of pulling in some some kids to learn the, the music, to sing along with these mm -hmm. incredible music. I mean, what an opportunity that is. And so it's an easy sell <laughs> for kids that are interested in music. So yeah, we did. We had that. I think one of the things that I've seen just that has grown in NAO, and maybe this is just from the outside looking in, but you hit a lot in collaboration, a lot in education. And I think that has hit a lot of people because they didn't realize what could be done. Like you said, they just thought, oh, he's an artist, he's a musician, he's, you know. But no, you're hitting, edu I mean, I love it to hear that you're educating the teachers in Arabic music that they can pass on to their students. I mean, this thing could be huge. It could be, you know, nationwide. Mm -hmm. you know? I know that's not just the dan dance element I get into the other no, the music that's, side. it's all, it's all important. It's all important because it's all about live music. And from my perspective as, as a dancer these days, um, that, that music has to be there. It has to be available. There is no comparison. Any dancer who's worked with recorded music and live music, and we're lucky in the Middle Eastern dance world because 
we can rationalize getting out there with live music. Other, you know, tap dancers, <laughs> belly dancers, they don't all have that opportunity quite as easily, honestly, but, but, but we can make it happen. We can make it happen. And once you've had that experience, again, never mind with the quality of music that's created by the musicians that you work with, Michael, but, but any kind of live music, it's so much more inspiring and the energy is so strong. It just evokes more from you as a dancer. And once you've experienced that and you've seen what you're capable of when you have that kind of, of call that you have to respond to, nothing else will really do. So, so no, to me, it all comes together to keeping live music on, at the forefront. And that's important. Well, and the concert in January was, uh, and this was in January 2020 before everything went sideways. Just, just about six weeks before everything went sideways. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, was, it was pretty well. But I, I need to put a shout out there to Sarah Fergani and Ken Spire because they covered it very well. And I was, she and I were talking afterwards. I mean, I think we have a fan that she said, you know, if you need an MC in the future, she's there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I think it's great because we, in San Antonio, you have to get the word out to people you know first and then it snowballs. But it takes, it helps when you have somebody like Ken's Five has been around for a long time mm -hmm. to help you out. Right, right. Yeah, Sarah was a, an anchor woman on and she was um, an MC, the MC at the Houston concert, yeah. and which is, yeah. and she, That's what she talked about. She said it was so much fun having that, and then she had so much fun doing it here. So, you know, it, everybody loves the music. The music gets you going. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically, I always think about the African term, I can't remember how this story was told me, but the African term for music is that which makes us human. Oh, wow. Or the arts is that which makes us human. And that makes, sense because we're all inspired I, I mean we get it all this I'm feeling more energy flying through this room right now mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like and I came in here going <laughs> I know yeah I think we all do yeah <laughs> well okay great so now let's talk about that little that one little piece in January of 2020 hmm let's see what was different about it oh yeah there were dancers on stage <laughs> so what was that so I uh, from you being here, and when you were here to play my first show, and you've been here in 2017, 18, 19, and 20 now, mm -hmm. for my dance studio showcases, just as Michael, the amazing player of the nay, joining the other musicians that I have. But in January of 2020, that was the National Arab Orchestra Takht Ensemble on stage, and four dancers joined you. So. I can tell you what a big deal that felt like for us. Yeah. <laughs> felt like a really big deal for us. And um, but it, it's a, it's a it's a bit of a launch, right, Michael, into some things in the future. So this is the, now you're going to have to you're going to have to move up to your microphone because I'm going to turn it over to you for again for a while, because I want to talk a little bit about folding dance in to your work with the orchestra, and and I want to start with whatever experience you've had as a musician with, and I'm just gonna say, belly dancers over the course of your career. So when, when, when did you play for your first belly dancer? I, I don't remember when, but <laughs> you know, before I had started the orchestra, there was, uh, you know, I would, I would play weddings and nightclubs. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I'm out of that. <laughs> um, and, and occasionally they'd bring a dancer and you know the common thing is like oh a dancer's coming oh mm -hmm. and you know you have uh you have the current state of affairs when it comes to the arts in in the arab community and dance is kind of clumped in on that and it's clumped in a little bit but underneath music only not only because but mostly because i mean most of the dancers in this country are non-arab mm -hmm. if not all of them so you know I didn't pay attention much to the whole thing. I, I enjoyed being able to play, and like I'll play a solo here and there if the singer would allow it. I mean, this is the type of environment you get when you work in uh, in weddings and nightclubs. You know, it's a little bit uh, dog eat dog, <laughs> and uh, so I'm t again, I'm really glad I'm out of that <laughs> damn environment. But. Uh, 
you know, aside from that, I didn't have much experience with dancers. Uh, it wasn't until I, I went to Cassandra's uh, events that I started to get a little bit more into that. Um, but again, there's just not much material. There are a lot of musicians that will go and do workshops, uh, and a lot of it's cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is a little misinformed mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they would relate the information of the music to the dancer. So now there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, there hasn't been, honestly, a big focus on merging the two. Uh, I wanted to do that because, well, if we have an orchestra, orchestras have ballet dancers, why do, are we not elevating that conversation for our cultural purposes? At the end of the day, it's part of the culture, it's part of the history, and regardless whether or not dance in this country is a product of cultural appropriation, it is still part of our story. Again, that goes into the mindset of owning the narrative rather than playing defense, mm -hmm. you know. Right, so. because it could easily, I think, just as easily be considered a bridge, another bridge to build, you know. I don't. I don't look at it as a bridge. Uh, you well, know, I do. We 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 look. <laughs> okay, Julie, go ahead. Referee. Uh, time, time, okay, time out. Time out. <laughs> Just kidding. No, uh, if you if you because we'll use that term in the NAO a little bit. It's the use of that term is a little bit looser in the NAO. I mean, the building bridges to cultures and bringing communities together, linking. Uh, you know, first, second, and third generation Arab Americans to their cultural roots. That's that's fine, but that that's that's a program that we have. For me, it's not building a bridge as much as it is uh, establishing the tone. You have to set the tone for the conversation. Nobody does that. They simply just continue the narratives that are already there. You know, I'll talk to a lot of uh, activists in the Arab American community, and they'll have a beef with dancers, and they'll liken it to a blackface almost, because you have these non-Arabs that give themselves Arab names and put on thick eyeliner, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, the Arabs will feel like, well, you know, this is appropriation, and... I get the sound bite and I get the the premise behind what we're talking about but I but the truth is the situation doesn't match the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, dance came to this country by way of an Arab. And the Arab wanted to make money and danced in Vegas and danced in New York and then it started to spread. That's how it happened. That's not cultural appropriation, that's cultural dissemination. Whether or not the community wants to hold dance at the same level it would hold other art forms has to do with certain conservative or cultural or religious ideas that Arabs brought with them from the Middle East that don't necessarily represent the actual Middle East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you have to remember, at the end of the day, while there are a lot of Arabs here, they're mostly immigrants. They left because they were not satisfied with the way things were going there. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the entire population of the Middle East here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have a fraction of it. Right. And whatever that fraction has set has kind of been promoted and passed on. And like any other immigrant community, continued that's that's how it happened. Well, and I think that's a, a huge part of, of the views of dance because honestly, um, I mean, I don't have, I don't don an Arab name when I go out and perform. You know, mm -hmm. I've just studied the movement styles from a lot of Arab women mm -hmm. in addition to others. And, and I, I, you know, I, I present my take on it. But, I mean, you've got violinists in your string section that don't have Arab names <laughs> that are playing Arab music, that's not cultural appropriation. But maybe I am. 
<clears throat> and and the reason why it's an easy target is because what you do is a little bit more at the forefront than a violinist in a section. Now, if that violinist in a section were to go out by themselves and say, I am a representative of Arab music, then somebody might say something because like, well, who are you to say something? And again, that goes to the problem in the way we present things. There's so much cross bleed between the different types of avenues Arab Americans express themselves that it all gets bundled up. Right now, if somebody wants to learn Arabic, they have to go to a church or a mosque. And that's only enforcing the stereotypical boundaries that plague the community. Um, but it's, uh, you know, you, know you, you have to be able to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to it, you either own your culture in its entirety or you're going to end up with some version of the truth that isn't whole, mm -hmm. that isn't complete. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier, that people have this convoluted sense of truth today. You know, and all you have to do is look at the political environment to kind of see it. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I'm not, I'm personally not interested in nothing but something that's complete and real and representative of what the entire picture is. So that's why it's important to be able to have these conversations, you know. That's why I don't want the NAO to be a political organization or be making political statements. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you do that is the minute you align yourself with a tribe or an idea. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd much rather be a fisher of men than to be a scalper of heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, never heard that one, but okay. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, you, widen the net so that you can get more people mm -hmm. to see who you are, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Right. So it, it is important. Dance is an important conversation because not only does it talk about an aspect that is uh, part of our culture, but it also talks about another aspect in an indirect way through a social context to help other people realize how much of Arab culture is really Arab mm -hmm. and how much of it is give and take. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that East and West have been giving and taking between each other for centuries. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So, and these are things that don't get talked about. Be they do at my studio. Uh, yeah, yeah, they do, uh, but they don't get talked about enough. Turn on Fox News or CNN. Oh no, yeah, they don't get yeah, talked about enough. And, and but see, that's that, that, and that. This is one of my big things with with dance. You know, that's um, it's a massive, very available window to a huge segment of the population in the United States of America. Belly dancing. Oh my God. There, there was a time, many many years ago when people would say, oh my God, you do that, that's really interesting. Now, if, I, if anybody brings it up, somebody's gonna tell you about their friend, their family member, their, everybody knows somebody that tried this kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? And, and if it is presented, and I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna tell the way I do it at my studio, in a way where you can stare straight into the eyes of a musician who is of that culture, you can have a conversation with that person, the music isn't just some techno thing going on an MP3, but you can see it being created. You, you, you start sensing that there's more behind this than just the movement and the music. There are people, there, there's an entire culture behind this. There's so much more to understand. That, that's a huge window of opportunity, again, I'm saying, from, for a huge segment of the population to view that side of the world in a different way, or to at least give themselves the opportunity to, so that the next time you see the guy being apologetic about whatever on Fox News or CNN, you, you remember, well, you know, it doesn't seem like that, because I've met some people that are from over there, and they're okay, you know? I mean, like, literally, I have heard women in my studio say that. And so, 
Call us what you want, okay? Cultural appropriator, I'll take it. However, I will, I will say that because of some crazy belly dance class I took when I was 10 years old, I have a, a, a much wider lens on that region. I mean, it has led to so much curiosity and study and, and interest and inclusion because of that. And I think we have to be really careful because the, the population that focuses on the Arab world because of this crazy little fitness or fantasy thing called belly dancing is huge. It is huge. And if they, and I know it because I run the test annually in San Antonio, if they are exposed to the musicians that create that music, that are familiar with that culture from that side of the world, their minds blow wide open. And it's a massive opportunity. Well, it, it, it falls in line with the, the way we do things at the orchestra. When you want to get to know someone, you invite them over for dinner. That's how life works. You grow up, you make friends. Oh, hey, Timmy, come on over. We're going to have pizza. Okay, great. Then you get to know the family. Then they become best friends. The same thing, uh, it's the same premise. You want to get to know a culture, you take a look at the cultural representations. Don't take a look at, uh, uh, don't, don't waste your time on religious thoughts. It's a nice supplement, but it's not, I mean, not everybody is going to believe in the same thing, even people sitting next to each other in the, in the pew in the same building, mm -hmm. you know. So religion is out, politics are out, especially now because the state of politics in the Arab world are in such a disarray that you can't tell whether or not politicians are working genuinely or whether there's some sort of motive. You don't know if the system is broken or not. I don't know. I'm Arab. I don't know. Hell, I feel I'm, that way about Arab. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I mean, but, but, so, so those aren't good representations. But when it comes to culture, and you hear somebody from that culture say, hey, this is why we do this, then it gives you an idea of the motivation of the mindset of the belief system, the actual belief system. We're not talking about God in the sky sitting on a throne waiting to judge. We're talking about the reason why people act and do and say the things they do. Mm -hmm. And the arts are the cleanest, most pure window for you to actually see that. They are, however you come to them. Yeah. However you come to them. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, so. I know that now I've pulled you into a, a bunch of stuff with teaching dancers and, and helping them understand the music from from your standpoint. And and you don't know this here. Let me clue you in. But there are there are a lot of um, workshops and stuff that go on in the dance community that are kind of a la carte, one off by various musicians, usually percussionists, occasionally a different musician will teach a workshop. but there's never anything sustained. I've taken millions of them over the years, and it's, it, it's tough to assimilate that when, when it's just these you know, little hodgepodge, hour-long things by various musicians. So Michael is now teaching um, consistently these courses, Arab Music for Dancers, and they're five-week-long courses. Each, each course is five weeks long, and it focuses on a piece of music. And because he's a conductor, and because he's a multi-instrumentalist, he's got a different way of looking at it than just someone who plays one instrument or or just has you for an hour. And so he's been teaching these courses. You're on round two now, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. And it's 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 fantastic. And even though a lot of the dancers are like, whoa, it's really it's really tricky because you know he's a musician and so he he uses musician language that a lot of us aren't familiar with but but that's the point. All all musicians do that when they're talking about music. You know, they they've got their their way of communicating that is familiar to them. And that's why it's important to have a sustained conversation about it, preferably with the same individual, because then mm -hmm. it, you, you start noticing the similarities across pieces of music. Right. You start noticing, oh, he used that word before. I think I get what he means. You know, like it, it, it starts coming together. And so before, before you met me and I started dragging you into all of that, had you done much 
like what were the, the communication with dancers other than what piece of music do you want or was it even nothing nothing okay no. okay so so I'll take full credit for that that was just trying to find them. <laughs> just kidding but this is a big 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 deal these and I'm gonna keep using the word sustained sustained conversations between dancers and musicians this I feel like is something that's been missing you know um, and, and I, I'm super excited about anything that we can form in the future that will keep that going because I think I for myself as long as I've been involved in this I can tell that's a missing piece mm -hmm. you know I can feel things filling in just from that and so to be able to take dancers at an earlier point in their journey and introduce them to that I think can be huge you know you'll find a lot of dance students that just don't know how to listen mm -hmm. and 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 that's made harder like they'll know what they like we're not saying that they're tone deaf or anything but they're listening to something foreign so the idea is you have to have conversations that make them familiar with how it works and it's not going to happen in just one sitting it has to happen through consistency and examples you know some people might talk about uh, Arab music and associate things with emotions and that's fine but it's not accurate because Arab music doesn't function that way not to say that it's not emotional but that it is subjective what makes you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander is doesn't really apply in this situation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everybody's going to take their own emotion and interpret it the way they want to interpret it so we don't have these conversations it's much more important to to have the conversation of you're listening to this piece of music why don't you listen to when this phrase ends and when it when it starts or when it starts and when it ends and then see how many phrases come together now take a look at the bigger picture and why are you doing this so that when you are dancing you're not simply memorizing an entire piece with all the repeats but you're understanding a structure mm -hmm. which allows you which frees up your mind to think more about what you're going to do in the moment because that's how Arab music works. Nobody goes in uh, and with a whole sheet of music and pre-writes out every ornament. That's done on the spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you'll hear certain musicians, even big time musicians when they go and they play improvs, if you listen to enough of their stuff, you'll start to identify them with their sound. Mm -hmm. And you'll start to notice some of the same licks and patterns and things that they do. And they do it because it's every musician has their bags of tricks and they have their vocabulary. And, you know, when you're on the road and you're doing things, it, sometimes it's just easier to just kind of piece Legos together that you already have in your bag. Mm -hmm. Ditto dancers. Yeah. Carry on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it's easier to do that when you have an idea of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's easier for a dancer to dance when they have an idea of what they're listening for. When does the sentence start? When does it end? We're going to something new. Do I know it's something new or does it all sound like a wish wash? Right. 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 Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's why, um, that's why we, we do the whole improvisation thing. You know, a lot of the dance experience when I was learning dance and in the Western world still is learning someone else's choreography. You know, I'm just going to teach you do this, do that, do this, do that. And so you're memorizing what they're telling you to do and not necessarily associating it to why musically are we doing this now. And so if you're not forging those connections, then you're not learning anything that's transferable to the next piece of music. You're simply memorizing this stuff and there's just a lot of that but but when you're in project band our little curriculum you know we just rip the net right out from underneath you and so you're you're, you're on your own and if you're just going to execute what i always say is if you're just going to speak to me in full sentences 
and you don't know what words are making up those sentences, much less what letters are making up those words, you're going you're gonna to fall flat really, really quickly because it's not going to fit at a certain point. And it is yeah. about listening and realizing what, what fits. So, so, I mean, I'm, I'm having a great time working with you on all of this kind of stuff, developing these lessons for dancers because there's just a, a world, a world of opportunity coming up. And hey, maybe soon, <laughs> maybe soon. <laughs> so I had mentioned that one of the concerts that's on the books, like ticketed people in the audience concerts for the NAO is October 2nd, 2021, here in San Antonio, Texas, at the Buena Vista Theater at the University of Texas, San Antonio downtown. And and that's gonna happen October 2nd. Simultaneously on that weekend, wrapped around that concert is the 25th anniversary of my studio, the showcase with that. So that's just gonna be a huge extravaganza that we will cut up in detail as I'm driving you to Houston on Thursday. <laughs> but but subsequent to that, um, having forged that connection between the the Takt Ensemble and 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 you doing all of this work teaching music to dancers and and my thoughts about dancers and live music, we are, I think I speak for both of us when I say that we are looking to the future about bigger ways, bigger ways to, to instruct dancers on how to work with live music and giving them the opportunity to do it. Because once you've done it and you understand the benefits, not just of that experience, but what it what it gives you in terms of what you can carry forward into all of your subsequent dance experiences. There's, there's nothing, there's no equal, there's no equal. And um, right, Michael, we've got big things on the horizon. Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So, all right. I think, um, Julie, we just left you out of that. You're still here, Julie. Thanks for staying. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to happen that way when we were talking about the, the committee and bringing them here. That yeah. was, that no, was all. No, that's okay. I, yeah. I figured. I, I was in the middle part. Well, and, and honestly, you know, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to have all of our meetings. We would have been having meetings all along. Uh, that's but, true. But you did notice me go over to your house last week, and that was my way of going, get ready. We're yeah. getting ready well, to start up again. If you remember, that was supposed to be in December that we're going to get together. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, but, you know, we, we've had, I've had a grandbaby come and, you, you know, there, there's been things that have been happening. And, yeah. But when she calls me and says, okay, I have to get, yep, okay, it's time to get back together. It <laughs> is. Get, yeah. It is because we've got things to do and the world is starting to open up and the NAO has a, a presence in, in San Antonio and Houston already that we are, we are going to continue and, working on and and who knows where it goes from and there. And it's almost April, and this is going to be at the beginning of October, so that gives us six months. Okay. To get it together, we can do it. We can do it. Yeah, we can do it. Any final thoughts from anybody? No. No. Well, good. All right. All right. This is fantastic. The National Arab Orchestra in Texas. Yay! Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Michael. Thank this you. is Baby Boomer Belly Dancer. <laughs> But I have no Arab name. Signing out. <laughs>